Hello, and welcome to this Neurology Live peer exchange titled Global Approaches to the Management of Relapsing Multiple Sclerosis. I'm Dr. Fred Lublin from the Kareem Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Joining me today in this virtual discussion are my colleagues, Dr. Wallace Brownlee from the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London, Dr. Patricia K. Coyle from Stony Brook Neurosciences Institute in Stony Brook, New York, and Dr. Sven Moot from the University of Münster, Germany. Today, we're going to discuss a number of topics pertaining to the diagnosis and treatment of multiple sclerosis, offering a global perspective. So let's get started on our first topic, the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis has for the last almost 20 years been dependent on something called the McDonald criteria. This is a set of guidelines that were first published in 2001, uh, named after the chairman of the uh, group that first put these out, Ian McDonald, who came from, from Dr. Brownlee's institution in the National Hospital. Uh, after coming out in 2001, they were modified in 2005, in 2010, and then the last time in 2017. Each time they've become more and more evidence-based and each time has improved upon the accuracy uh, and also has produced some simplicity uh, in terms of uh, acquiring the, uh, these criteria. So, so Wallace, why don't you start out and talk to us about the 2017 revisions. Thanks, Fred. So I, I think some of the key changes that came in the 27, uh, 2017 revisions to the McDonald criteria were changes in the requirements for dissemination in space and some new sites were added for dissemination in space, including the inclusion of cortical lesions. And I think more importantly, and what's had a bigger impact on my practice, is the inclusion of symptomatic lesions uh, in dissemination in space. So in patients with transverse myelitis, we can now count spinal cord lesions on MRI in our MRI criteria for making the diagnosis of MS. The other key change for me was the addition of oligoclonal bands. So if, if, if patients have unmatched IgG oligoclonal bands present intrathecally in the CSF, this can be used as a substitute for either clinical or MRI evidence of dissemination in time within the diagnostic criteria. Good, so, so Patricia, you're rather critical of the, of the 2001 uh, uh, criteria. So as they've evolved, have you become happier with them? I am now a fan, Fred. Uh, I think the 2017 diagnostic criteria are very crisp, very clear. I think we should be promoting using them on a regular basis. That's not really being done in the United States. I like that they clarified these are supposed to be applied to very crisp neurologic syndromes, not foggy brain, not pins and needles, uh, not uh, joint pain, muscle pain, but the optic neuritis, the transverse myelitis, the isolated brainstem syndrome. They clarified that periventricular lesions should abut the ventricles because people were calling periventricular lesions that were not, and juxtacortical lesions should abut the cortex. And I like that they really pushed imaging spinal cord. Uh, we do the entire spinal cord routinely and that they really enhanced the value of spinal fluid. We routinely do CSF on everybody. So I am currently a big fan of these revised diagnostic criteria. Okay. May I, may I add uh, something for Germany? I mean, you all might know that we uh, kind of have a history when it comes um, to spinal tapping. So we liked it forever. And so we are very happy that it's now included in this new criteria. But I learned uh, that in the US, you are not doing it on a regular basis. Is this correct or? It's rather variable. For example, as Dr. Quayle said, she's long been a proponent of spinal fluid analysis and the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Other centers, not so much, including ours. But I must say that, that since the 2017 criteria came out, we're doing more spinal taps. And, and I think it's, it's been a useful addition uh, to the criteria, even though it kind of breaks the concept of dissemination in time, which has sort of been around so long 
um, that I kind of miss it in terms of the uniqueness of multiple sclerosis, but I think it's been an important change. I, I did want to highlight something Patricia said and say it again, that, that the criteria are really for typical uh, first episodes, first clinically isolated syndromes of partial myelitis and brainstem cerebellar inflammatory lesions and, and optic neuritis. Uh, and that's what they were tested in for their accuracy. And other vaguer neurologic symptoms don't necessarily um, hold up. Another important point I want to make that I'd like you to comment on is that, that McDonald is for diagnosing multiple sclerosis, not differentially diagnosing multiple sclerosis. I think that's absolutely right, Fred. And um, the application of these criteria, how they perform in clinical settings is entirely dependent on what the pretest probability of MS is. So if you're evaluating someone with nonspecific neurologic symptoms like Patricia described, then these criteria uh, uh, shouldn't be applied. And really there's still a, a key role for the clinical neurologist in taking a history, undertaking a neurological examination, and confirming that the, the person has symptoms that are suggestive of MS, and at the same time being vigilant for other conditions that may mimic multiple sclerosis. I think, Fred, that's really a key uh, point, that everything rides on having ruled out other possibilities for the syndrome, creating the differential diagnosis, evaluating the patient, and that's why, I mean, we would argue for a very robust laboratory workup.